wintry weather. I really appreciate it. I'm Richard Callaghan, the library director. I know I know most of you. Um, thank you for coming for part two of our pandemic series. And today we're talking about malaria. Um, I also want to say that I always do thank the Friends of the Library for sponsoring this series. Uh, without their help, we couldn't do any of this. And thank you for making the brownies. Thank you. Yep. Uh, wonderful. But uh, let's like Dan take over as our favorite speaker. Hi, Dan Reed for Van Eck. Welcome, everybody. Today, as you just heard, we're going to be talking about malaria. And that means we can just, without further ado, go to our first slide and never appreciate it's ready. Again, like I told you last time, I'm cheating a little bit with this presentation because. Malaria really isn't a pandemic. It's something that the human race simply has had to put up with for uh, at least a couple million years now in one form or another. And I think as you'll see as we go along, there's a, a theme to today's presentation, and that is that malaria is almost like the quote that is often misattributed to John Lennon, that life is uh, what happens when we're making other plans. Uh, and malaria is what happens when we're making other plans. The best laid plans uh, tend to go aglay because of malaria. And we'll see some examples of that as we go along. But first, a little background, and now we'll get to the first slide. When we're talking about malaria, we are talking about a parasite. And in particular, this parasite here, that dark looking splotch on the screen, and that is Plasmodium falciparum. And we know that Plasmodium falciparum is our protozoan parasite originated in Western Highland gorillas in West Africa, which is the home, tragically, of malaria. And it stayed around in the bloodstreams of gorillas for untold how many hundreds of thousands of years until one particular moment. And it only took one particular moment at one point in time when a human, one of our ancestors, hundreds of thousands of years ago, got in too close a contact with one of these mountain gorillas that had that protozoan in it. And the consequence was the plasmodium falciparum spread at that instant to this one female. And that's why, although we'll never know anything else about her, she's also known in the literature as malarial Eve, the malarial Eve. <laughs> and what that meant was that plasmodium, that parasite, the plasmodium falciparum, was now in the human bloodstream. And what it did once it got in the bloodstream is it went to the liver, first in this one malarial Eve, and then to everybody else who contracted malaria. Once in the liver, at least for the time being, it was masked, uh, relatively safe from the bodily immune response. It replicated in the liver, and then from the liver, it spread into the bloodstream. And once Plasmodium falciparum, after replicating, had gotten in the bloodstream in great numbers, it was able to attack red blood cells, uh, as you see here surrounding the parasite. And that was not a good thing, because once it got to the red blood cells, it could attack hemoglobin, which, as you know, is what contains the iron that spreads oxygen throughout the body. It's absolutely crucial to us. And that's not going to be good for anybody infected by this parasite. But the other thing it's going to do is replicate in the red blood cells and actually separate into male and female forms, which means eventually it can reproduce conventionally. Now, once it goes to the red blood cells, once it gets there, it produces proteins. And the proteins surround the red blood cells. And the proteins were always changing in character, which really frustrates the ability of the body to undertake a really effective immune response to this parasite. And that means it can't really be effectively dealt with. And now that it has been differentiated into male and female parts in the red blood cell, it's eventually going to begin emitting toxins, which go throughout the body, causing terrible symptoms, as we'll see. But the most important thing, now that it is male and female in nature, as we go to the next slide, and it's all set for a visitor. And the visitor, of course, is the Anopheles mosquito. Uh, there are 112 genera of mosquitoes. Anopheles is only one of them. And this is the vector that spreads malaria. Because the interesting thing about this for me, it may be to you, is that while male and female types of the plasmodium falciparum and uh, all other kinds of malaria uh, can be present in red blood cells in the human body, they don't reproduce until they get into the gut of the Anopheles mosquito. That's the only place they can reproduce. So once the Anopheles bites you, now it's got fully adult uh, new forms of the parasite in its gut, and it can then fly on in its two-week lifespan and infect other people in spread malaria wherever it goes. I know that all of you have a prejudice against Anopheles, 
Oh, they're all bad. I hear the chatter. Monopolies is terrible. We hate monopolies. We don't them around. No, don't, don't feel that way. Uh, there's a lot of different kinds of monopolies, and there's only about 40 of them that spread malaria. Yeah, they're uh, virtually nice neighbors to have around. Uh, but uh, this particular monopoly is very harmful because that, of course, is a vector that is so effective at spreading malaria. And what happens eventually in an infected human body is the red blood cells burst. It spreads the toxins much more efficiently around the body that way. And the result is chills, a high fever, fatigue. And in fatal cases, what happens is it uh, gets into the brain, maybe produces slightly more oxygen, coma, uh, and maybe if it's plasmodium falciparum, the uh, ultimate effect could well be death. That's the most terrible form of malaria and the most likely killer. But there are four other kinds of malaria that are typically strike uh, northern European populations, and that, that has been present in the European uh, story for many hundreds of thousands of years. And Europeans had different names for that kind of malaria, that the somewhat less uh, fatal kind. Sometimes you would hear it called quatrain fever, which means that the fever spike every three to four days in that kind of malaria. Sometimes it was tertian fever, which means the fever spikes every 48 hours. Europeans, especially the British, often called it ague. And if you read Shakespeare's plays, there are eight different references to ague. Shakespeare was quite familiar with it. Uh, and although it wouldn't necessarily kill you as effectively as plasmonium falciparum would, it nevertheless would uh, leave you ill for a long time, could kill you, and it would come back periodically, sometimes for the rest of your life. And as I said, it could kill you. Dante died of malaria. We think that James I of England died of malaria. In plasmonium falciparum, the worst kind, could sometimes make, a, make its presence known in some parts of Southern Europe, at least, as time went on. We go to the next slide. Uh, we're gonna start telling that story. Uh, this is a case of a, a very badly infected red blood cell. You can see that it changes the shape and the red blood cells can no longer do what they're supposed to do. And that uh, could very well be fatal in the worst kind of malaria uh, carried by Plasmonium falciparum. And we think that in the fifth century AD, this is the kind of malaria that struck Italy uh, out of the blue. And it probably made it much less easy for the Romans at the beginning of the fifth century to fight off the worst of the Gothic invasions that occurred in the peninsula uh, at, at about the same time. To be fair, Alaric, the Visigoth who sacked Rome in 410, he died of malaria uh, on the way from Rome. Uh, ultimately, he hoped to get to North Africa. Uh, but it probably didn't weaken the empire to uh, a devastating effect. And for many, many centuries after that, weaker forms of malaria were an ever-present visitor in Rome. Uh, almost every year, people would come down with malaria, people would die there. One reason was if you live close to the Tiber River, that was a big bleeding free ground, still is, uh, of mosquitoes, back then, especially in Nopolis. And that's one reason so many people died. The Tiber, of course, was a terribly polluted stream under the best of circumstances. Uh, not only were there a bunch of mosquitoes there, but the river was so polluted that you would never want to even eat fish if it was caught a few miles off the Tiber as it went into the Mediterranean. That's all that the river was, but it's especially a killer because of monopolies. And malaria stayed around, uh, always in Italy. It was an ever-present fact of life. And sometimes it's just get worse than other times. We know in the year uh, 1166, an imperial army led by Frederick Barbarossa approached Rome to try to capture it. Half of his army died of malaria, meaning that he eventually had to retreat. Our cardinals of the Catholic Church hated it when popes would die during the sickly season in the late summer, uh, late spring and into the summer, because that meant they had to go to Rome for the conclave. It was all too likely they'd sicken and die if they did that. Uh, sometimes uh, about a dozen of them would die at these conclaves, depending upon the season where they went. And in the early 16th century, uh, at least three popes died of malaria. Uh, Rome was probably not the best place for them to be. Uh, Avignon a little bit better, uh, but not much. Uh, malaria was, was everywhere, and it just depended upon how virulent it was, whether you would just sicken or whether you would die. But uh, as a matter of history, it is Africa. That's the home of the worst forms of malaria in Europe, where although it could kill you, maybe not quite as devastating. Now, I said that malaria is what lays waste sometimes to the best plans that people make. Now, I thought I would begin giving you some examples of that now that we know a little bit about the disease and, and how it spreads, largely by mosquito vectors, of course. One thing that always fascinated Europeans, this is taking off from our lecture on the Black Death last time. 
was the interior of Africa. Europeans knew just a little bit about the interior of Africa in the early Middle Ages and into the late Middle Ages, but above all, they knew there was gold there, and they really wanted to get to that gold. And we saw that the great impetus for the Portuguese explorations of Africa was the need to trade for gold. But what if you went into the interior? What else could you find there? And Europeans were quite interested in that. But the bad thing about this for them was that going into the interior, if you were a European until the late 19th century, was almost completely a death sentence. You went in and you died, and there wasn't much more to be said than that. So I'll give you an example. Uh, this brings us to the first character in our story. Uh, that's a Scotsman. We'll be talking a lot about the Scots today. And this is the first one that is Mungo Park. Mungo Park, 18th century, was fascinated by Africa, wanted to learn as much as he could about Africa. He was not interested in conquest. Europeans understood the conquest of Africa was out of the question. You go in any kind of expedition, likely not to live long. But Mungo Park thought, at least we could turn something there, maybe a small expedition wouldn't be affected so much. And so, in 1805, uh, after he had spent some time earlier poking around the coast, Mongo Park was able to convince a group in the British Isles called the African Association to finance an exploring expedition to the Niger River, a stream that Europeans knew existed, but which they knew nothing about. So Mongo Park in 1805 gathered about 35 soldiers who were willing to sign on with them, and a few more Europeans who were in the nature of scientists, got them all together with the support of the African Association and took them down the west coast of Africa, where they landed near the mouth of the Gambia River, and their idea is they're going to march inland to the Niger and explore as much of the stream as they can, see what they can find. So we got these 35 soldiers, they got red coats, they got nice black top hats, uh, and they're going into the Gambia River, and in no time at all, now it's the late spring, uh, it starts to rain. Uh, within six weeks, literally everybody was sick, mostly with malaria. And within four months, three quarters of them were dead. Now, this remnant weakened, got to the Niger River. Mungo Park wasn't sick yet because he'd been there before. He got malaria before, survived it, had a bit of resistance. But the others had no resistance at all. The thing that Mungo Park had to worry about was dysentery. He had dysentery so bad that he took a bunch of mercury. Uh, that uh, probably was not a good idea. He actually even salivate because he'd taken so much mercury. But at least he wasn't dead yet. Uh, so all the way to the Niger, uh, they go. They actually got to the river. Uh, and once they got to the river, it just got worse. Uh, everybody was weak. They got enough energy to build a boat so they could go down the river. Uh, but by the time the boat was ready, uh, others had died. And by that time, out of the 44 that went with Mongo Park, 40 were dead. Wow. And then they got in the boat, uh, and down the river they went, and they did get to Timbuktu. They got to Timbuktu, which is, of course, very interesting to them, presumably, although we don't know how interesting, because after Timbuktu, uh, back down the river they went, uh, they hit some rocks with a with shipwreck, uh, and they were too weak to swim to safety. By now they were under attack by Africans, uh, and they all perished. Uh, so we know just bits and pieces of that expedition, but the one thing we do know about it was that it was malaria that killed most of them. And that was the story in Africa. If you were Europeans uh, up until the late 19th century, uh, it was so bad that when the British began to try to put it under the slave trade and they wanted to keep garrisons, small garrisons in uh, Sierra Leone and uh, also in what is now Ghana, Nobody wanted to serve in those garrisons. The death rate was over 50%. So if you were sent to those garrisons, you sent goodbye to everybody you knew because it was unlikely you were ever going to come back. So that's how bad it was. Malaria would also kill Africans, of course, as it still does, because that's where the worst form is, plus modulum falciparum. Uh, but if there's, there's really no right side to this. But there was some resistance among West Africans that Europeans didn't have. And it came in the form of the inherited trait hemoglobin S. Uh, and if you get hemoglobin S from one parent and hemoglobin A from the other, that means that your red blood cell shifts shape in a way that frustrates malaria. And so you're less likely to get malaria if you've got that hemoglobin S. But it's very bad if you have hemoglobin S from both parents because that means sickle cell disease. Uh, and, and that's a terrible thing. But if you have one, from one parent, hemoglobin S, 
uh, you, you won't get the sickle cell disease in your some resistance to uh, malaria. That means you're just a carrier. So in terms of this disease, uh, we know that what effect it had was in the nature of a shield in West Africa, a shield from European conquest. And it was that way until the late 19th century. If we go to the next slide, uh, it was just the opposite. This is, by the way, this should have happened before. Uh, this is about all, and all of this is conjecture, of course. This is where Mungo Park was among the Niger River. But you can see how little known Africa was in the late 18th and 19th century to Europeans. Uh, going in there, what was it not possible for them? It wouldn't be for a long time. But now we can go to the next slide. Uh, the, the opposite in terms of malaria to Africa was the New World. And we know that there was no malaria in the New World before Columbus, before Europeans arrived. There were plenty of anopolis, but the anopolis were no problem because there was no malaria. But then Europeans arrived. Many of them were infected by malaria. They had bouts of malaria. Some of them periodically throughout their lives. And when they arrived in the New World, of course, the anopoly bit them and then went on to bit Native Americans, indigenous peoples. They bit the Taino, they bit the Mayans, they bit the Caribs. And wherever those mosquitoes went now, instead of a harmless bite, they would now carry malaria. And they carried off untold numbers, hundreds of thousands of people. Smallpox killed the indigenous peoples, measles did, uh, many diseases did, but malaria was one of the primary killers that made it easier for Europeans to settle the new world. So, so malaria had the opposite effect here. Uh, it predominantly killed those who had no resistance at all to it over time. Now this disease, which frustrated the best laid plans of so many people, had a particular result in Scotland. And we now tell another story about another famous Scotsman, and that's this guy here. Uh, that is William Patterson. A different Patterson than the one who gave rise to the name Patterson, New Jersey. This is a different guy. Uh, William Patterson, Scotsman, was very wealthy in the 17th century. He was one of the founding directors of the Bank of England, one of the most outstandingly successful institutions in human history, made a fortune of trade of various sorts, part of it, regrettably, the African slave trade. But his primary fame and his primary influence came as the director of the Bank of England. And he felt he knew trade. He felt he knew finance, which, in fact, he did. What he didn't know was geography. Because <laughs> this is his idea. Now, beginning in 1695, there were catastrophic crop failures in Scotland. Maybe as much as 15% of the population of Scotland died. Uh, 15, 1695, 1696. Uh, oatmeal, the staple food of so many Scots, was prohibitively expensive. Hardly anybody could afford it. Perhaps one sixth of the population was reduced to begging on the roads uh, by the last five years of the 17th century. So this is an emergency. Scotland is a miserable shape. A time, remember, when Scotland and England were still separate kingdoms. They had one king, William III, in London, but they were uh, two separate kingdoms. William III eventually uh, gave it away to Queen Anne, or Queen, uh, Queen Mary, then Queen Anne. Uh, so still separate kingdoms at this time. And William Patterson had an idea. So we're poor in Scotland. Regrettably, we're getting poorer, it seems. The secret to wealth is trade. The secret to wealth is trade. Well, he knew they couldn't compete with the East India Company, which had a monopoly on trade with the East. So Patterson decided to save Scotland. He would look west, towards the New World. And his idea was to get a charter from first William the third, but uh, later uh, his daughter, his, his wife, Queen Mary, uh, what he would do is get a charter, and the charter would be for the Royal Company of Scotland. And the Royal Company of Scotland would then go to the New World and found a colony in Panama. Oh. And the wonderful thing about this, it was known as the Darien Expedition, was that if you had a colony there, you could be the great middlemen of the planet Earth. Trade from the Pacific, trade from Asia, would go to Panama, the Royal Company of Scotland would build a road from the Pacific to the Atlantic along the narrow isthmus of Darien, and they would charge a fee on everything that went from west to east and east to west. And before you knew it, Scotland would be wealthy. Scotland would be rich. So Patterson pitched this idea. He got the charter uh, in London, and he began to uh, rally support among anybody with money in Scotland. 
And if you had any money in Scotland, you were fired with enthusiasm for this scheme. This is the way of wealth and glory. Scotland will be one of the great kingdoms of the world. First time. And he began getting hundreds of thousands of pounds into his coffers to finance the Royal Company of Scotland on this venture to Panama. And it wasn't just wealthy financiers who gave almost all they had to this. It was also small investors. If you had a pound, if you had two pounds laying around, you gave it to William Patterson. He was a brilliant marketer for this idea. And he met with outstanding success. This is what he said. It's going to be easy. We just show up. Look at the map. Just look at that. Narrow, narrow little bit of ground. All we do is build a road, and this is what he said. Nothing would be easier than to construct wheeled carriages that would take only a day to roll from coast to coast. It's only about 60 miles. Now you might be saying to yourself, if this is such a great idea, why didn't the Spaniards do it? Uh, they, they've been there for a couple hundred years. Why didn't they do it? Well, Patterson would explain this. They have no imagination, those Spaniards. But where are thoughts? We can do this. Uh, and, he, and, he, and he said, that the soil is jet black. The soil is good for everything. We can raise anything we want there. Uh, the sea swarms with turtles. And eat the turtles in addition to the crops. Uh, and those mountains up there, we know there are mountains on the isthmus, but that is, a, that is a sign that the climate is nice. You got these nice mountains around. Uh, they really can't miss. He called Panama the key to the universe. And he raised the money. And everybody wanted to go. So 1698, he had plenty of funds, got five ships ready to go to Panama. 20% of all the available capital in Scotland went to this company. Some estimates are more. 20% is probably pretty good. A wholly Scottish venture. Uh, the English might have participated in this, who contributed some money, but the East India Company strongly discouraged that. We don't want any money going to them. So this was almost entirely a Scottish venture. So many people wanted to go that they tried to stow away on the five vessels on the way to establish a colony in Panama. And they wept, they wept on the docks when they were caught and sent back into Leap on the day of departure. Well, their first mistake, the five ships on the way to Panama, was they didn't go down to the English Channel. They went north over by the Orkneys to get around the British Isles. They made the same mistake the Spanish army made, although with less excuse. And imagine you're a lowland Scot, and you've never been to sea. And now you're in the North Sea, and the storms are raging. You're going like this, you're in the hold of the ship, and it's going like this all the time. And many describe that as the most terrifying moments of their lives, those who survived. <laughs> but they finally got to Panama. Uh, November of 1898, and if you go to the next slide, they got down to work building a town. So they found this uh, little peninsula. Patterson knew it was there. This is what they were headed for. Uh, so New Edinburgh is going to be here on this little peninsula. They uh, dug a canal through here to make navigation a bit easier. And they got out of their ships. They built stockades and they built huts. They got down to work. They soon found out that not a whole lot would grow there. They soon found out that the native Indians were not that interested in the cones and the mirrors that they had to trade <laughs> for what food they needed. So right away, there were problems here, but it didn't get really bad until April, because April is when it began to rain. And the rains brought with them an offer. And when I say rain, I mean rain. Now these were Scots, and you're saying to yourself, so they're used to rain. Well, these mostly lowland Scots, and they get less rain than Boston does uh, over the course of the year, contrary to popular belief. This is Panama rain. They never seen rain like this. Nobody ever saw rain like this unless they've been to the tropics. They couldn't believe it. It was drenching daily, horrible rain coming down all the time. And with it, of course, standing water, and with it, the anomalies. And pretty soon, by June especially, but by May, uh, is where it began, people began to die. About a dozen a day died of malaria, including William Patterson's wife and William Patterson's child. He himself came down with malaria, barely recovered. All of the clergymen with the expedition, there's 1,200 people. Uh, all of the clergymen died. By July, so many were dead that survivors gave up and abandoned New Edinburgh to save their lives. Half of them were dead. 
Half of them were dead by now, mostly of malaria. And the others had lost everything they had. What they didn't know was another expedition was coming to join them. Yeah. There had been an earlier expedition that was shipwrecked. But now another expedition came to join them. And when the settlers got there, they found nothing but abandoned huts in weeds and graves. The thing to do now, I would say, is turn around, but they got to work. They're going to make it go. And they began to die. And not just malaria, dysentery probably made it worse for many of them. But the number one killer was malaria, Plasmodium falciparum, present in wide quantities around the tropics, regrettably. Eventually, the Spanish showed up. There were a few survivors. The Spaniards took them on their ships. They continued to die on the ships. Many of them who were left ended up wandering the New World, some of them in places like New York or Charleston. A total of 2,400 Scots went to New Edinburgh. Uh, 300 of them lived to go back to Scotland. And that's it. 300 of them were alive, uh, either in Scotland or in various parts of the New World by 1701. The company was bankrupt, lost everything. What are the stockholders going to do? They put everything they had in the company. Many of them have lost thousands of pounds. Now we go to the next slide. If you go to Edinburgh and you want to hear more about the Panama expedition, uh, just go to the National Museum of Scotland. And this is the famous Darien chest. This is where the records of the Darien Company were kept, Panama Company, by William Patterson before they left. This is a monument to the folly and the misery and the catastrophe of the Panama Expedition. Wonderful idea, maybe on paper, but an idea that didn't take account of the anomalies. We go to the next slide. The result of this was that the stockholders in the Panama Company, the Darien Company, the Royal Company of Scotland, they decided that they wanted a bailout. So they went to London and they hoped to get the British government English Parliament to bail them out. They were Scots, not English, of course. And the English said, we will bail you out. We'll make good your losses. We've got the money to do it. We're the English after all. Uh, the condition, though, is you've got to join us. Uh, so before we have the uh, famous Cross of St. Andrew, the Independent Kingdom of Scotland, next slide, and the uh, Independent Kingdom of England, the Cross of St. George. But because of this, because of the need to bail out the company, uh, ultimately, the stockholders, the leading financiers of Scotland, agreed to accept union with England, and that's how we got in 1707. Next slide, that Union Jack, the United Kingdom, formed because of the failure of William Patterson's company. So, uh, if there's a right side to all this, depending how you look at it, uh, maybe that's what it is. The other corollary is that uh, the company, the Royal Company of Scotland, the Panama Company, now bailed out left some money in the hands of those financiers who thought they were bankrupt. And what they did with the money, some of them, was they founded another corporation, and that's the uh, Royal Bank of Scotland, which is still there. One of the most important banks in the world, the Royal Bank of Scotland, was formed because of all this. Now we go to the next slide. Keep that in mind, though. Keep in mind the Union Jack. Best laid plans of man, uh, also mice, uh, may be foiled by malaria. Now we go to the height of the American Revolution, the year of 1780, talking about a great idea, a great plan, the British decided, uh, having failed in their efforts to subdue much of the Northeast and the Middle Colonies, decided to concentrate their efforts on the South. So they managed to capture Charleston under General Clinton in 1780. And from there, Clinton left to go back to New York, leaving General Cornwallis in command. The idea was to fan out into the interior of the Carolinas, summoning loyalist militia to join them and put an end to the rebellion by putting an end to the Patriot Authority in South and North Carolina. And that's what Lord Cornwallis proceeded to do very successfully. Well, all through 1780 uh, into 1781, he won engagement after engagement, captured all these outposts, destroyed the Patriot Army under General Gates. Everything's looking great. But what he noticed was toward the end of the summer of 1780, his men began getting sick from malaria. Now, not enough to destroy the campaign. This was not plasmodium falciparum. This is the less virulent kind. Might not kill you, but it would make you sick and weak, so you couldn't be a very good soldier. Now, that left Cornwallis with a bad taste in his mouth. So, in the next campaigning season, 1781, now it's March, 
he was able to win a big victory over American forces at Guilford Courthouse under General Green. Meaningful to me, because my street in Somerville was named after General Green. But he wanted nothing to do with another summer in the Carolinas. And that was one of the reasons why he decided to march into Virginia, where there was less malaria, especially in the middle part of the state where there are more hills. And he wanted to take the war into Virginia. And that might have made a big difference, except he was ordered by General Clinton to go to the coast to establish a base with contact with the British fleet. He didn't want to do it, but he did. So off to the tidewater he went in the summer of 1781, and once more, his men were struck by malaria. Only this time, he was even worse. Over a third of his army went down with malaria by the end of the summer, 1781. And the same malaria, the same kind of malaria that had almost wiped out the Jamestown colony in 1607, now struck Cornwallis' army. And by the time Rochambeau in Washington showed up at Yorktown and laid siege to the city, Cornwallis was in no condition to mount any effective organization. His army was sick. All of you have probably heard the old story that Cornwallis would not surrender his sword in person to General Washington. He had uh, feigned illness. He pretended to be ill. I think he was probably ill. Most historians think he probably was sick of malaria. And that's why he couldn't go out to surrender his sword. But the army did surrender malarial infected army in 1781. And the result of that is another flag to go to the next slide. That <laughs> So malaria has had an inordinate effect on human history. Uh, all of these effects of malaria are conjoined with other things, of course, in history that made these events happen. But you can never ignore the consequences of disease. And malaria <laughs> is a disease that is magnified in its effect on history by its presence at certain times at certain moments when people weren't expecting it and where it could have a dreadful effect. Now, thinking of that, speaking of best laid plans, we now go to the year uh, 1809, and I'm a little bit sick of picking on the Scots, so I'll pick on the English. We'll go to the next slide. It's the Napoleonic Wars, and the British government had a wonderful idea because, remember, they were constantly threatened by invasion by Napoleonic armies. And in one place where Napoleon was gathering ships in 1809, thinking maybe it might be possible to invade England, was the great port of Antwerp. To frustrate those plans, the British government decided to send a military expedition to the island of Walcheren in the Scheldt River Delta, not too far downstream from Antwerp. And the idea was to use that island. Here it is. It's not an island anymore, as you can see, but it was that. This is Walcheren, uh, right down the Scheldt from Antwerp. This would be the largest expedition in the history of the British Army to seize this island and seize Antwerp. 40,000 men would go on this expedition. 600 ships would take them to Walcheren Island. And the main supporter of this idea, this brainstorm, was Lord Castlereagh, Minister of State for War. The idea was to settle from England. He was thinking about this since 1797, but now he was finally going to be able to do it. They were all going to settle from England, take this island, march to Antwerp, and seize any ships that were there. Now, it did not go well that the man chosen to command this expedition was a guy named John Pitt. And John Pitt had, for the last seven years, had a death job in the military by which he got a reputation for laziness. And I would suggest that if your reputation is laziness at a desk job, maybe you don't want to be sent into the field to command an expedition. But that was lost on Warren Castlereagh. It also did not bode well that Castlereagh, believing this would be a walk in the park, among the 40,000 men, he sent only 33 doctors. Ooh. Only 33 with any medical training at all. Now, what they didn't know was what Napoleon knew. Napoleon knew full well that Walcheren Island was famous for fevers, okay. unless you've been there a while and have built up some immunity, <clears throat> especially malaria, number one malaria. So the British landed there at the end of July, 1809, worst possible time to go, smelled malaria season, but they landed there at the end of July, they captured Flushing, the town of Flushing, mostly by destroying it, but, but they captured what was left. 
Now, at all costs, General Pitt had to get those guys off that island into Antwerp. But General Pitt was not the guy to do that. He was not just known as lazy. He had now acquired a couple of nicknames I, I thought I would share with you. One was General, my Lord, I am waiting. He was known as my Lord, I am waiting. And his other nickname was General Curl. <laughs> oh, by the way, I forgot to mention the one thing Patterson got right about Panama, there were plenty of turtles. And they did eat a bunch of turtles. <laughs> not enough. Anyway, August 20th, Fevers began setting in. Mostly we think malaria. Within a week, 10% of the army was too sick for duty. And then the deaths began. Hundreds every week on Walk Heron. You go to the next slide. And the problem was Anopolis, which was doing very well that month on Walk Heron Island, not just because it usually did well, but also because the poly that ordered that the dikes be broken so that much of it was flooded. Mosquitoes everywhere. What was causing this? Nobody knew then that mosquitoes spread malaria. All the doctors, what few of them there were, could see was that people were sick and they were dying on the island. What was it? What they thought was causing this was old, rotted, vegetable, effluvial matter that lined the canals of the island, setting up rotting smell, ultimately infecting human bodies. Bad air, which is how we get the word, of course, malaria. All they knew was that people were dying and dying quickly. You'd be out on sentry duty, we have plenty of stories of this. You'd be out on sentry duty, everything was fine. And then without knowing it, chills set in, awful chills, the worst you've ever experienced. And just like that, you were unfit for duty. You had to lay down and hope for the best. Hoping maybe there was a place to lay down by then. So many were sick. The doctors, faced with all this, were overwhelmed. By September 3rd, a quarter of the army was sick. Every single carpenter in that army was busy making coffins. And the healthy, who were terrified of feeling ill and getting ill, had to watch as wagons laden with the sick and dead creeped down the roads of the island. Some of the army roused itself and tried to march to Antwerp, which is what they were supposed to do. They didn't get far. There was no hope of getting there. Within a few days, a third of that force was sick. Many of them died. General Pitt went home. A bunch of the army went home. Castlereagh, however, afraid of completely losing face over all this, ordered 16,000 men to stay in Walcheren, of whom 9,000 were unfit for duty within a week or so, by the end of September. 300 a day were dying. 300 a day. There were two battalions of that army that had literally nobody fit for duty by the middle of September. So many sick, there were not enough blankets to go around. It was not uncommon to have a hut with 12 soldiers in it lying down on straw in two blankets for 12 soldiers. Nobody thought this would happen. Criminal neglect. The largest British expedition in history had just turned into the largest British military disaster in history in terms of numbers involved and percentage dead. It was so bad, Cathalray was playing for it, of course, that uh, George Canning, the foreign minister, tried to have him ousted from the uh, the Privy Council around the Prime Minister, Castlereagh heard that Canning was trying to get rid of him. So at the height of this disaster, September 21st, Castlereagh challenged Canning to a duel, the most famous duel in British history. And Canning, the Foreign Minister, agreed to fight a duel with the Secretary of State for War, Castlereagh. The only problem with this is that George Canning had never once in his life held a pistol. <laughs> and Castlereagh was known as one of the best shots in Ireland because he was one of the mandatory aristocracy there. Uh, so Canning, now going to his death, he must have been really nervous. It's 6 a.m. on Putney Heath, uh, outside of London. Uh, Castlereagh somehow missed. Canning actually hit one of the buttons on Castlereagh's coat, uh, did no harm. Uh, and then Castlereagh took a second shot, I uh, hit Canning in the thigh, then, so down goes Canning, and uh, then they agreed to call it a day after that. Uh, Canning survived. But both of them lost a lot of their reputation over this. How absurd that in this moment of emergency, these two guys would be fighting a duel. At any rate, finally everybody came home. Uh, but by then, 
uh, after this expedition was over, uh, 8,000 were dead. 8,000 dead out of the 40,000 who went. And if you weren't dead, you were sick. And so many were sick, they were no longer fit for duty. And the Duke of Wellington during the Peninsular Campaign uh, over the next few years would always complain if anybody from Mulcairn would show up in his army because they knew, he knew they were no good for any sort of campaign. And it was malaria that did. Many of them, by the way, would suffer relapses for the rest of their life. And many of them had large spleens, which is one of the signs we know it was mostly malaria that did this. Dysentery was probably involved too, mostly malaria. Uh, by the way, these are some of the dead being taken on rowboats to go out to the ships to go back to England. Uh, by the way, uh, while Karen would enter history once more in a devastating way, it entered history in 1944. Speaking of boneheaded military decisions, the Allies took Antwerp, which they needed for a major port to, to win the war in Europe. But they forgot that Antwerp was useless without Mulcairn. So they had to land an army on Mulcairn. And the Canadians fought and died there right, in great numbers in the fall of 1944. It's one of the last great battles on the Western Front uh, in World War II. So we're almost ready to conclude. But I did want to mention one bright side to all this, because by the early 19th century, by the time these guys were dying on Mulcairn, one of the doctors on the island was a guy named Dr. McGregor from Scotland. And Dr. McGregor understood what was needed if more lives were going to be saved, if any lives were going to be saved. Because by then, it was fairly well known that there was one way you could treat malaria. And it wasn't by enemas. It wasn't by bleeding, which they often would do. It wasn't by really hot cupping on your back. It wasn't by making patients sleep with a copy of the fourth book of the Iliad on their pillow, <laughs> which is the other thing they tried. The thing that would work you go to the next slide, was that. And they knew that by the early 19th century. That's the Cinchona tree that only grows, at least naturally, on the hillsides of the lower Andes in Peru. And all the way back in the 17th century, Jesuits in Peru, who had arrived there with the conquering Spaniards, heard from the Indians, the Quechua Indians, that this bark, powder from that bark, would cure you if you had the chills. And it occurred to the Jesuits, to say to themselves, maybe this might work on malaria. And in fact, it did. And by the 18th century, this began to be used to address malaria in those who had difficult cases. There was a prejudice against it, however, in Protestant countries of Northern Europe, because the Cinchona was identified with the Jesuits. It was known as the Popish Bark, or the Jesuit Bark. And they were a bit leery of it, but to Dr. McGregor's credit, he was willing to try anything. And because he knew this would work, and because it had worked in the past, uh, some of the British had even begun to try it in the 18th century. When an American ship happened to be passing by, Dr. McGregor gathered all the gold he could from the British Army Will Karen. He approached the shipmaster, having been told that, that uh, Chinchona Bar was on board, and bought about 1,500 pounds of it from the American ship. Uh, more would have died in Will Karen than did, but other been for that decision. <laughs> that powdered chinchona bark, chinchona bark, would address malaria. They had all sorts of controversies about the dosage, how much would work, which had a mix it with, all manner of dispute about that. But they knew one thing, and that was it would work. And the reason it works, we go to the next slide, is because the chinchona bark has dipped a wonderful molecule in it, that's quinine. And although they couldn't explain it, what happens is if you chew the powder of the bark, quinine gets into your blood, and quinine latches onto an enzyme that the parasite, the protozoa, the plasmonia or whatever other type of malaria it is, uh, tends to absorb. So it absorbs quinine with the enzyme, and that can kill it. And that can kill it in great numbers. And that means you might get better. And eventually, even Northern Europeans recognized that this chinchona, which contains quinine, was the cure they were looking for for many centuries. This would actually work. And the only question was, how are they going to get enough of it? Because the only place it grew was Peru, and it only grew on those hillsides. And the Peruvians, it was so important to them, by the way, that once they were independent, they put the Cinchona tree on their seal to get the Peruvian flag up. That little tree is the Cinchona tree. Uh, it was so important to them that they were selling it at exorbitant prices to the rest of the world, and they were harvesting these trees, and they cut down the trees, and of course, that would mean the bark would be harvested, and that was it. It wasn't really sustainable. So they had to find a way 
to create as many cinchona trees as they could without paying talk of the Peruvians. And one of the great stories of the 19th century, great or maybe not so great, depending on how you look at it, not so great if you were Peruvian, was the story of how Europeans got into Peru, found saplings of chinchona trees, found seeds of if that's all they could get, and tried to find other places in the world where they could be planted so that Europeans would have their own supply of cinchona without dealing with Peruvians. Um, many stories about this, we can't go into a lot of them, but Clement Markham, this is a big question for you, I probably nobody will get this, but we met Clement Markham last year. He was the one who sent Sir Robert Scott to the Antarctic on his ill-fated expedition to the, the South Pole. Uh, and Clement Markham, he sent Clement Markham, he was really young, found cinchona saplings, took a few hundred of them, planted them in the hillsides of India, and they flourished for a while, but not as effective as they hoped. So they could plant cinchona trees, never quite worked out. The only people who got this right were the Dutch, uh, because the Dutch got cinchona trees from just the right part of South America, just over the border in Bolivia. They found cinchona trees with high quinine content, content. And they took those cinchona seeds from Bolivia, they got them to the Dutch East Indies, they planted them there, and that's where the world supply of quinine came from, beginning in the mid 19th century. And that made all the difference. Now the price of cinchona came down, never low, but it did come down enough for European states and armies to afford it. And that's how Europeans conquered Africa. That's why by 1900, all of Africa, besides Ethiopia and Liberia, were under European domain. It was unthinkable without quinine. But beginning in the 1870s, not coincidentally, when the price of quinine came down, that's when the pace of exploration and conquest went up. Free stolen rifles had a lot to do with it, uh, but so did quinine. Never ignore that. And with all the effects on history that had brought in its way, consider the high importance of quinine uh, to the, the, the human story, and particularly our modern story. But I did want to mention, I'll uh, go to the next slide as we conclude, that this quinine supply that ultimately the Dutch were able to plant in the Dutch East Indies uh, would go along with another great discovery that would make a vast difference in human history. This is one of the great benefactors of the human race. Uh, that's Ronald Ross, a British surgeon in India. There had long been a theory that maybe mosquitoes spread malaria. The Chinese thought so for a long time. He decided to put it to a test. He had patients who he knew had malaria. He had patients who he knew had the parasite. He isolated the parasite, he knew what that was. So all he did was he let the mosquitoes in, let the mosquitoes bite them, dissected the mosquitoes, found the parasite in the mosquitoes, and thereby proved that Anopheles is the vector of malaria. And he did that in 1897, won a Nobel Prize for it. And now we knew two things. We knew how to treat malaria, maybe how to prevent it, because if you take quinine, it's a prophylactic, uh, it goes into the liver, prevents replication by the plasmodia in the liver. So we, we can prevent it, we can treat it, and now we know the mosquitoes that causes it. And that brings me to the last story. We now we get to World War II, and when we get to World War II, we go to the next slide, guess what the problem's gonna be, beginning in 1941. Where is the quinine? Where is the cinchona? Uh, it's all in the Dutch East Indies. And the Japanese took the Dutch East Indies in late 41, early 42. And that meant that Americans would have to fight in the South Pacific, malarial territory, apparently, maybe, without quinine, and in no time at all, we began to get sick. Uh, about a quarter of all the guys on Bataan at one time were out with malaria because there wasn't enough quinine. And later on, during the invasion of New Guinea, a quarter was a rosy picture. Sometimes half of American troops would have malaria. Didn't mean they would die, just when they were combat ineffective. And this could have been a catastrophe for the war effort in the South Pacific. Without quinine, what did they give the Marines? Does anybody remember in the Army? Uh, there was one thing that had been developed in the 30s that had some effect in preventing malaria, not like quinine, uh, but not bad. And that was Adabrine. Remember that? And Adabrine was the little pill, and they were all told to take your Adabrine, take your Adabrine, you're not going to get malaria. Go to the next slide. Oh, oh I think two slides up. No, uh, Retreat, retreat. Now that we're using military language. Oh, here, 
Uh, so they, they wanted to prevent the, the soldiers from getting malaria, so they tried to prevent them from being bit by mosquitoes. Make sure this mosquito nets over your bed, so I make sure you do this or that. Uh, this is the Dr. Seuss character uh, before Dr. Seuss was famous, and uh, that character, and as you can see, I uh, am a mosquito, and uh, you're supposed to read these books and know how to prevent mosquito bites. Oh. But of course, that was kind of do in the long term. One of the great unsung heroes of World War II is a guy named Fisher, Arthur Fisher, Lieutenant Colonel Arthur Fisher. And I wanted to tell you what he did. It is March of 1942, and the Japanese are about to capture Bataan. Great War is going to hold out a little longer. And by that time, there was one supply of Sinshona that the U.S. Army had its disposal outside of the Dutch East Indies, and it was down in Mindanao, where the Japanese hadn't gotten yet. So Dr. Fisher, who had cultivated those chinchona trees, hundreds of thousands of them on Mindanao, at great personal risk, would take off on these rickety old planes. I don't know if any of you know aviation very well. Belanco pacemakers, wooden planes, unarmed. So he'd take off in these planes, and he'd go down to Mindanao, and he'd gather all the quinine he could down to Mindanao, and he'd take them back to Bataan. Never enough to make the troops swell, never enough for everybody, but he kept them fighting long enough to go into April without surrendering. But the great story about him is uh, he was on the last plane out of Bataan to make one last trip to Mindanao right before Bataan fell. And the guy who piloted that plane is the, the, the kind of guy you always meet in war and not that much in any other context. And his name was Jitter Bill, Jitter Bill Bradford. General Bill was fearless. He never cared about being shot down or anything, but he was one of these very nervous people. So they called him General Bill, the Chittery Bill, because he would do things like possibly rewind the seven day clock on his plane. You only had to rewind it once a week. He'd rewind about six times an hour before <laughs> like this all the time. So General Bill Bradford flew Dr. Fisher down to Mindanao one last trip. And while he was there, he gathered all the best quinine he could find, the best powder bar, natural quinine. And he established a system so that he and the guerrillas, who would eventually be formed in the Philippines, could take some of that quinine and get them to the new prison camps in the Philippines in May and June to keep as many of those guys alive as possible. And not only that, he organized an effort that throughout the war, up until 1945, under the very noses of the Japanese forces, would get quinine from occupying Mindanao. Fisher's going in and out, in and out of Mindanao. And he's getting the quinine surreptitiously on submarines to American soldiers that are on the Pacific. Could have been killed at any time. Uh, that's Dr. Arthur Fisher. But for all, and he actually planted quinine, uh, cinchona trees in Central America to try to grow quinine for the war effort. But that wasn't going to be enough. So they tried adabrating at first, and the Marines didn't like that. It might help prevent malaria, but they didn't like it because there was a widespread suspicion, a rumor with no basis of fact that it caused impotence. <laughs> so they didn't want to take that. And so many of them got malaria. Uh, like 8,000 members of the 1st Marine Division on Guadalcanal were down with malaria. And the only saving grace for this was the Japanese suffered as well. Uh, it was very difficult to get all the Tinshona they needed from the Dutch East Indies, given American submarine attacks to the troops on the fighting fronts who needed it. But it, there was such a shortage of quinine that, although a lot of people remember the rubber drives in World War II, a lot of people forget the quinine drives from all over the country. Anybody with quinine was asked to give it up, send it to centralized areas so that the troops of the South Pacific could have a supply. Never enough, but at least some. So a combination of adabrine, some quinine, Lack of dysentery meant that although a lot of people did get sick, tens of thousands got sick from malaria, it wasn't enough to stop the war effort until 1943. And that's when the second thing the US military did to combat malaria happened. Now we go to the next slide. And that, of course, was DDT. Uh, DDT had been invented in the 30s, one of the great first synthetic insecticides. And the Army and the Marines found to be sprayed this everywhere that seems to kill the Anopheles. And wherever that was sprayed, malaria incidences went way down, just in time for the campaigns of 43 in Tarawa and the great campaigns of 44 uh, in the Marianas. 
So the DDT will be one of the secrets of the military side to success. They sprayed this everywhere. Spray DDT everywhere they went. Everywhere, everywhere DDT was sprayed. And it worked so well, they killed mosquitoes. We go to the next slide. They began spreading it around the United States and uh, the CDC in Atlanta. The reason that's in Atlanta was Atlanta was a center of malarial control for our Army Southern camps, training camps in World War II. So the center for malaria control in Atlanta became the CDC. And beginning in 1946, after the war, DDT was sprayed all over the United States. As you can see, there's nothing wrong with DDT. I wouldn't want to think. <laughs> uh, but uh, the moral of that, you know, best laid plans again, best laid plans of people in malaria disrupts them. Uh, of course, we know, as Rachel Carson showed, that uh, DDT is, is dreadful for the environment. It causes the eggs of bald eagles and other birds to be ruinously thin so that chicks can't hatch properly. It's no accident that there were only a few dozen breeding pairs of bald eagles in the lower 48 by the late 1960s. Today, there are over 71,000, uh, back then, almost none of them. So DDT on the environment would be ruinous and still is, but still in human bodies to this day uh, for those who have somehow adjusted it. And ultimately, that would be banned by the EPA, where the first thing the EPA did was ban DDT, uh, which leaves us with other ways to fight malaria. And the good news here is that we now have a malarial vaccine that was approved by the World Health Organization in 1972. No, I mean, uh, 2022, just a couple of years ago. If you go to the next slide. And the situation we're faced with now is that there was very little malaria in the United States, almost no malaria. There were some cases recently that were reported, but it was mostly eradicated in the US, partly because of DDT killing the mosquitoes, but also because with plenty of quinine, Good natural quinine, which is much better than synthetic quinine. The natural stuff is what really kills the, the, the parasite. Uh, with so much quinine, so easily treated malaria, uh, people were cured of it. There wasn't much malaria in bloodstream, so that means what mosquitoes were left. Uh, couldn't spread much malaria because people just didn't know as much of it. And more people were moving to cities rather than living around marshy areas anyway. So you put all that together, and we got almost no malaria in the United States. But there's plenty of it in Africa. There shouldn't be, uh, but uh, drugs are still not cheap. <clears throat> they can't reach everybody in Africa. One thing that seems to work well is to take insecticides of various kinds and to coat mosquito nets with them. And if you sleep under a mosquito net coated with insecticide, the mosquitoes die in Africa, but it doesn't affect other parts of the environment. So that's one good thing. You can, you can actually smear a wall with insecticide, and that kills the Anopheles. And that's one way to control malaria, but again, you can't go everywhere you like, and that's why between five and six hundred thousand people a year still die of malaria, almost all in Africa, and about two thirds of them children. Uh, so that's the situa situation we're faced with. And now the question is, can this vaccine work as well as it might, and can this get to as many people as possible? Which might be for the first time since malarial Eve, for the first time since that mountain gorilla. Uh, somehow spread this parasite to the first human being who acquired it, maybe malaria will no longer be the disruptor of plans that it's always been. <laughs> and we'll end on that note, a hopeful note, I hope, uh, for all of you. Go ahead, yes. I was in Tanzania about a decade ago, and there were large blue cloths uh, covering the driveways as we drove into the hotel. And I asked why they were there. And the answer that I was given was that mosquitoes liked that particular color blue. And those huge claws were covered with some sort of an insecticide. Uh -huh. And the malarial mosquitoes would fly to those claws and die. That could be true because mosquitoes are attracted to blue. Has anybody else heard that? Yeah, it's blue jeans. Oh, really? Uh -huh. Well, because wasn't there a tradition in itself? You you paint the top of your outdoor porches blue. The mosquitoes would go up there, and if you had some control thing up there, the mosquitoes would die. So yeah. unhappy people who are blue don't get malaria. <laughs> <laughs> it's now, does anybody else have any uh, unusual comments or threats? Go ahead. Wasn't there a story about the Panama Canal yeah. effort? And in fact, I think a previous one that failed and when the Americans succeeded in the book. 
McCullough's book. Uh, yeah, you were in McCullough's book, right? Yeah, well, I think I'm actually going to talk about some of that because in the future class, we're going to go into yellow fever. Okay. And the story of malaria and yellow fever are intertwined regarding the canal. When is yellow fever, do you know? I think it's next week. So it's next week for yellow fever? Yeah. <laughs> okay. A big difference between yellow fever and malaria. With malaria, you could, you get it once, but you can still get it and come back. My great-grandfather got malaria on Puerto Rico. He was one of the Massachusetts guys who went down to Puerto Rico to run through the way from the Spanish yoke. And as he put it, and, uh, he got malaria and stayed with him for the rest of his life. He was just having recurring thoughts of malaria. Uh, yellow fever is not like that. Uh, yellow fever can kill you more, but if you survive, you'll never get it again. Uh, that's a big difference between the two. The, the similarity, of course, is they're both spread by different kinds of mosquitoes. But we'll go into all of that, uh, I guess, next week. Not cholera? You got yellow fever? Okay. Uh. <laughs> cholera is a, a little grimmer than yellow fever. <laughs> yellow fever. Comparatively, is almost a joyous thing to find. Hansel, in his um, early 20s, did you know, a year long walk about Can't Africa. Hear. Um, my uncle in his early 20s did a walk about through Africa and got malaria. Really? And he dealt with it through the rest of his life. Yeah. Like, it was flare up to quinine, flare up to quinine, and just flare up. Yeah, you know, we all dealt with it through all his life. The namesake of my university, Brandeis. Uh, Louis Brandeis grew up in the Ohio River Valley, grew up in Kentucky, got malaria. I had a bad bout with it actually when he was very young. And uh, now and then he would just have these fevers. The malaria would just come back and he couldn't get very frustrated because he couldn't get all the work done that he wanted. Yes? So is that more kind of generic malaria? Well, well, you know, quinine works pretty well uh, if you take it in the right dose and you take it in time. So it's good to protect them and it, and it does uh, address the, the underlying problem because it goes right through what's happening in the red blood cells. Yeah, so that's that. And uh, like I said, what is this in the 1930s? We have synthetic quinine. We, we can make it in the lab. We can make the synthetic stuff. But don't, some of you may know more about this than I do. But the way I understand it, it's the various kinds of synthetic quinine. It's not that hard for the parasite to adapt to them over time. But it has a hard time with the natural stuff, the natural cinchona bark, the real quinine. That's still the best, the way I understand it. If, you, if you've got the disease and you need treatment. But, but there are other things that work, or other things to address malaria, but that, that's the original, and I, I think still the best. I could be wrong about that. Is that the so same thing? No, malaria is not good. It's from you to me. You've got other mosquito vector uh, crowding around. That's right. Um, yeah, so among the diseases that we're going to be talking about, the, the most contagious one will be the last one, influenza, between people. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that at the end. Yeah, yellow, uh, yellow fever is it? Sorry, that's not that. Hmm? Yellow fever. Oh, good. Yellow fever. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> Great. Well, so, you know, we get to talk about next week. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. Talk about uh, what, what, what seemed to be a good idea. Uh, one of the main reasons that the United States became a predominant power, one of the most wealthy nations on earth, the most wealthy nation on earth, is because of yellow fever. And we're going to talk about that story that has to do with Haiti. Uh, because and maybe a, a lot of the, the presentation is going to be about Haiti and what that had to do with American power. And that's the story about yellow fever. So I'm looking forward to sharing that with you. Yes, go ahead. Many years ago, I was, I, I was in the tropics and we used to have to take malaria pills mm -hmm. as a preventive. What would, they, what would have been in them? Going on going on. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I used to do that too. I spent my junior year abroad in Kathmandu. Mm -hmm. Kathmandu is kind of a, not really high elevation, but it's high enough to where there's not much malaria. So nobody cared about that so much there. But when I went down to the lowlands, the southern Nepal, I had to take those malaria pills like you did. Mm -hmm. And nobody liked them because they didn't taste good. So everybody talked about how bad those pills taste, the malaria pills. Still a good idea to take them. But you all know the story of how to make the, the powder, the cinchona powder, palatable. So you mix it with soda water, put a little sugar, put a little lemon in, and now you've got something that makes it a little bit better. And it was the Dutch, not the British, it was the Dutch who had the idea of putting gin in too. And we uh, gin and tonic. Well, the gin and tonic is uh, partly a heritage of malaria as well. Yeah. So maybe the best thing that came out of there gin and tonic. All right, so I think you're all ready for yellow fever. So we'll. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
very much. Great to see you all. Uh, and thank you for coming. And thank you to the friends for putting the brownies and the candy in the coffee. <laughs> Oh, I'm going to have a lot of people that do it.